All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode six of our Gilder Spotlight podcast. We've got an amazing guest here today, Melissa Kwan, CEO and founder of eWebinar and Spacio, but I will let her kind of do her introduction and, and share it from there. But Melissa, we're, we're thrilled to have you today. Thanks for having me, Brian. Um, yeah, so Melissa Kwan, I'm currently the CEO and co-founder of eWebinar, uh, which is a webinar automation platform. We turn any video into an interactive webinar that you can set on a recurring schedule, so you never have to do them live. So things like demos, onboarding trainings, things that you're doing over and over or wish you can be, um, we help you automate those with a video. Um, so this is my third startup, um, all bootstrapped. Uh, my previous two startups were in real estate technology, um, and just fun fact about me, I'm kind of based out of Amsterdam, but mostly like nomad, I would say like nine months of the year. Okay. Awesome. What, uh, and what ended up, what brought you to Amsterdam? Why did you choose there as kind of the, the settling point? Um, the parties are really good here. So <laughs> we kept coming back for the parties and eventually we're like, we should just live here instead of trying to argue with party, that? we could just be in the party. There you go. That's <laughs> awesome. And so appreciate the kind of recap about eWebinar and, and right, obviously being your third startup there. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself from, you know, what prompted your entrepreneurial journey from startup number one to what you were doing before then, and just a little background into kind of, you know, your as you were growing up, what led you to kind of take this entrepreneurial jump? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I was always entrepreneurial. I was just never an entrepreneur. Um, always tried to do things on the side with some friends, but never really focus on it full time. Um, the last job that I had was selling software at SAP um, out of Vancouver, where I used to live. And I guess at that time I was 26 or 27, and I was just kind of sick of working for other people and sure. really wanted to have something on my own um, and just decided to quit my job. I had some money saved up and decided to, to do something full time. Didn't exactly know what that was, um, but, you know, went to meetups and talked to people and came up with a bunch of different ideas. And, um, you know, my first company, we built mobile apps for real estate developers. So right out of university, I worked for a real estate developer um, selling like pre-sale projects. So before okay. building was built, um, I would sit in the showroom and um, started as, as a receptionist, but then also kind of worked my way up to be um, a salesperson. So real estate was kind of like my first career, I guess, um, on the business side. And after working for SAP, I just kind of decided to put the two and two together and, and create a real estate technology company. Um, and that was... I guess that was like a while ago. I want to say that was like, <laughs> I've been, a, yeah, so I've been a founder for like 13 years. Okay, that's great. And what, and so, right, you, you exited Spacio and had one other company in between eWebinar, is that correct? No, Spacio was my second company. So oh, I okay. had a company, um, my first one was building um, like iPad marketing apps. So okay. instead of getting like a coffee table book brochure, when you walk into a sales mm. center, we were the iPad interactive brochure and sales tool. So did that for four years. Um, that company turned into an agency model because everybody wanted to customize and, you know, we were bootstrapped, so we needed the project. And then before you knew it, we were building one-off custom apps for people. So, sure. um, that company kind of, I guess, became the second company. Um, mm. cause I was, you know, traveling to New York, getting to know what was happening in real estate, and just kind of saw a gap in um, open houses and sign-ins not being automated. So my second company, Spacio, was like an iPad check-in for open okay. houses, and we sold them to brokerages and franchises. Um, so agents would use them in their open houses, but we would feed all the data actually back to the company so they could see, you know, who's mo most productive, um, automate the follow-up with their CRM, and also see like real-time foot traffic. So that was okay. the one I sold in, in 2019. Got it. All right. So, so 2019, right, sold the company, got kind of out of the real estate side a little bit. And what was obviously a lot of entrepreneurs kind of identified, just like you did with, with Spacio and that identified a problem, tried to correct it or work to kind of find a solution. What was the transition moment to, that brought you to eWebinar? I know you kind of explained a little bit at the beginning, but was it something that you realized you jo maybe you joined a webinar that someone was hosting or what was maybe the light bulb moment <laughs> that prompted that? I mean, I probably hosted upwards of a thousand of them myself, um, wow, just okay. in, you know, my two companies combined previous e-webinar. So, um, you know, like when I say webinar, I'm also encompassing like one-on-one -on -one demos. So anytime sure, you're sure. using Zoom or go to webinar to deliver a presentation, like I would call that a webinar. 
Um, so my, you know, my previous company, we were an enterprise SaaS software. So when you sign up a customer, you need to help onboard their teams or agents. Um, and the only way to do that is through webinars. So I would do mm. these onboarding and training webinars like over and over, but people would sign up and not actually show up because we were also, um, you know, we were also servicing independent contractors that like they would like if they had a client who calls or they have to show a house, like you're kind of mm -hmm. the last on the totem pole. So I did a lot of these training and onboardings and demos like every single day. Like sometimes I would do like eight back to back and then I just wouldn't have the mind wow. share or the time or the energy to do anything else in my business. So I sure. always envisioned this perfect product that would turn a video, like the perfect video into a webinar that anyone can join on demand um, or they could schedule it at a time of their convenience, even at nighttime or the weekends, okay. um, kind of like, kind of like Netflix, right? Um, mm -hmm. Without losing the interactivity and the chat that makes a webinar valuable. And that's why people go. So I'd envision this product that would take like the perfect video with an asynchronous chat, kind of like a support chat where you can hop into respond live if you're there and respond by email when you're not just like any website, right? You go to any website, there's like mm -hmm. a little chat bubble that comes up. So I thought about this for probably the entirety of my last startup. Um, cause I, I was just such a small team. I was everything sure. except for code. So after that company was acquired, um, this was the idea that kept coming back to me. Like this was the thing that kept me up at night. Like I just can't believe that no one solved this problem. Whereas mm -hmm. everybody was dumping money into live broadcasts, right? Like it could be Instagram, Facebook, Zoom, like Restream, like you name it, right? Everybody's right, right. doing live broadcasts, but nobody is solving the scalability issue that comes with live broadcasts, which is like, how do I take the content, a piece of content that works, video content that works and do it a thousand times without a human being, but also deliver an experience that is even better because like video quality is better. There's no connection issues, right? No, nobody's interrupting you. There's no Q and A or housekeeping. So I just thought about it for so long. And I just thought like, if someone were to, if someone else were to solve this problem before me in the way that I envision, I would be pretty upset just because of how many years I'd thought of it. Sure. So two months after Spacio was acquired was when I started eWebinar to solve this particular problem once and for all, which is really to save people from doing the same webinar over and over and give them their time back so they can do literally anything else that they enjoy. Just not the same thing over and over. <laughs> Love that. And I, I'm sure a lot of people can echo the same issue they've had, whether they're, you know, on the account executive side or, or doing, you know, these webinars themselves, like you said, for the past thousand or so sides. And so would you say, obviously, from your experiences at your previous companies, there are probably a lot of learning opportunities and things you picked up along the way. How did those help shape your, your growth trajectory and when you started eWebinar, uh, what were there any kind of key learnings that you took from your first two companies through the journey that really helped kind of spark uh, or, or ignite the growth when you started your most recent company? Yeah, I would say the biggest lesson that I learned was to not choose a blue ocean opportunity. And just to define that for, for people who aren't familiar, a blue ocean opportunity is um, when you are the only company in your space. So previous to us, like, yeah, there were like open house apps, but like none that had real traction. So people didn't really know about them. So we were definitely the first enterprise level open house app. Like nobody had sold it to brokerages and franchises before. Mm. Um, and no one had built out like a full on solution. Um, like maybe there were like one or two page apps, but like someone had kind of done it on the side, right? So sure, okay. um, because of that, our sales cycles were so much longer. We were the only person, like only company educating the industry. People didn't know if we were cheap or expensive. They didn't really know what the ROI was because everybody was using pen and paper before us. And we're talking like 30 years. We're not talking like five years, <laughs> right? Like these agents are running right. these open houses for so many years and it had never been automated. And of course, this is also like real estate is an industry that is very um, like behind on technology. I mean, that's mm -hmm. like a, a known fact. So because it was blue ocean, it was just so hard. And I remember like after selling Spacio, I have a friend that is in consumer products. He's not in software, but he is a wizard 
at launching consumer goods. Like I saw him build a furniture company from nothing to like 50 million in revenue in, in, in like five years. Wow. He's now doing like a luggage company and it's been probably like five years and he's at, he's going to hit like a hundred million dollars. Like, and, and like, I'm like, I re like, this is just someone I respect a lot. And he told me, sure. Melissa, like there is something to be said about being the best second mover. Like when you're the first mover, like you, you make a lot of mistakes, you do a lot of market research. And you have to educate the market. But mm -hmm. if you pick a product that you can make 10 times better, someone else has done all that research for you. So you're just riding off their coattails and you have an existing market base that you can win over instead of needing to convince everybody from day zero. So that really resonated with me. And that's something that I preach now is like, especially if you're bootstrapped and you need the revenue right away, like, mm -hmm. Being blue ocean and being the only one in your space is not a good thing, even though, you know, it's marketed as a good thing. It's actually probably the worst thing that you can do. So I, I think that's like the biggest lesson that, that I learned. And, and that's great feedback. Cause I think so many times we, we hear entrepreneurs when you kind of put that famous chart, all right, us versus the competition, right? And you see a lot of people, Hey, we're the first to market, right? We're the only one doing exactly this. And a lot of times customers and investors, right? People learning about it say, all right, well, why are you the only one doing this? Are you the, is this idea so innovative that no one else has thought about it? Or, right, is there, is it too early, right? The timing is just a little bit different. And I think that's a great point for not just newer entrepreneurs, but but anyone in the space. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up that point too, actually, right, about bootstrapping and when you need that revenue early. Uh, I know on your podcast, you've had some guests that talk about this as well too, but what was your your decision and thought process behind wanting to bootstrap versus going the fundraising route or why, right? Was it more control, more opportunity to be a master of your own destiny? What was the, the thought process there? Yeah, I think a lot of people think about funding in a, in a business as a financial decision. Um, but for me, and I guess for a lot of bootstrappers as well, but they don't talk about it as much as I do, is it's <laughs> a lifestyle choice. When you take VC money, you are committing to a growth trajectory and an exit that forces you into a different lifestyle. So mm. maybe you have to have an office, you have to hire locally, um, you have to have board meetings, you know, you can't set your own schedule. Um, you know, you have to focus on growth such that you have to raise the next round. And a lot of times it's not like the VC says, Hey, Brian, you have to do X. It's because of the trajectory that you've committed to you are forced to do those things because otherwise mm -hmm. your business will suffer. You won't raise money. You can't pay your people. And as a bootstrapper, we're not tied to a number. I can grow slowly if I want to. I don't set an alarm clock in the morning. I have a f fully remote team of contractors. I can hire anywhere I want. Um, and actually it's because of that, that makes our company possible. Mm -hmm. Like because we don't have the money, I can't hire in North America or Europe. Like I have to hire somewhere else. And it, and it also kind of forces you to be more creative with your resources as well. Um, so, I mean, in, when I moved to New York, um, you know, seven, eight years ago, I thought I needed to raise money in order to be successful. But because nobody gave me money and I was trying to sustain my company, we became profitable in the process. Mm -hmm. And I saw how much pressure and stress my VC backed friends were, you know, versus myself who was getting closer and closer to profitability and actually having way better of a time working way less and being able to call all the shots. So I kind of saw two sides of the coin and decided that um, I was never going to raise capital and that I would figure out how to do it myself. And, and frankly, like 1% of startups are venture funded. Mm -hmm. So that means 99% of them are bootstrappers. So there are way more bootstrap companies than there are funded companies, but the VC funded companies just get more spotlight. They get more media attention. Yeah. And to that point, exactly right. You look at what TechCrunch and all these other publications are, are putting out there. Do you feel that not necessarily just the media, but the, com the entrepreneurial community as a whole puts a little too much emphasis on the, the glory of fundraising, if you will, versus, right, you see the big articles, company X raises 100 million, company Y raises this, versus, right, the the people that have grounded out for five, six plus years bootstrapping to, to profitability and taking that thoughtful route. 
not just with given the the way the economic climate is today, but do you feel like there's a little almost too much of an emphasis on the gl- glamorization of fundraising? Well, uh, there absolutely is, um, but media is paid through ads and clicks and PR firms, right? So to write about a bootstrap company is not that interesting. You know, like it's, unless there's a huge exit, right? Like a MailChimp or a Calendly, um, then it's, you know, then it's interesting, but there's not so many of those, right? And I would also say like bootstrappers just don't care about media attention. We don't need to manufacture growth, right? We're doing what we're doing, not for someone else. We're doing it for ourselves. And a lot of times funded companies need this media attention. They need the manufactured credibility in order for people to think they're doing better than they are. And that's the whole game, right? So I think, yes, there is too much attention to it, but I also understand that because the media is, is such that, you know, they need ad dollars and they need sponsorships. Um, but that's why I think it's important for us to have these conversations and share our experience in public and let people know that what you're reading is not, a, a good reflection of the reality of a normal founder. And also a lot of times what's written in the media, they're also not talking about the 99% of failures that this company had. They're literally just saying this company had an idea and someone put money in it. So I think it's important to, for, for founders to know that investment does not mean success. Being able to raise an investment just means that someone was willing to give you money. Like it's face, it's face value, right? Like it's nothing right. more than that. And that's not the end of the business. That's when the business starts, right? That's where the hard work starts. And I think it's unfortunate that the media only writes about the starting of a business, mm-hmm. right? How much money they raise, but not the ending of it, unless it blows up completely like we work, right? So um, it's just important for, you know, people listening to, I guess, calibrate their expectations and not compare yourself too much and and like and have the media or social media make you feel like you're not doing the right thing you're not on the right track because everyone's making it up as they go it's hard for everybody um and just not everyone likes to talk about their struggles yeah and to that point right because that you know i bootstrapped my last two companies as well and I, i get it right it's years and many times before you start to pay yourself it's years of grinding out the product before you even have that first customer meeting right or that first sales meeting do you feel like and especially when it comes to the struggles right by all means vc backed companies and founders have have their fair share just as much as bootstrap founders do you feel like it's up to the bootstrap founders to maybe talk about that a little bit more to provide that education um, versus right the just the vc founders doing their media tour yeah, I mean, I think some people are already doing it, right? Like myself, Greg Head with Practical Founders Podcast. He also runs mm-hmm. a cohort of Practical Founders. Uh, Andrew Gastecki from Acquire.com. You know, Nathan Latka. Um, so there are people that are very vocal about, you know, bootstrapping and the benefits of it. Um, I, I definitely wish there were, you know, more of that. Um, but I think in time, like this will, especially as like it's getting harder and harder to raise capital. Um, and a lot of VC back founders who can't raise capital are now reconsidering, um, you know, their path, whether it's, you know, their current venture or the next one. Like I have so many messages that come into my LinkedIn saying, Hey, like I'm, you know, I'm with a VC back company, but because I'm reading, like, because of what you're writing, I'm considering my next one to be bootstrapped. And, you know, that's pretty cool. Right. So. I wish that more people can talk about it because it's also like, I think it's really important for the community to know that there are many different faces of success. And the only definition of success that matters is your own. And I think a lot of times, and I fell kind of into that trap as well, like when you're not doing well, like you almost want external validation. Sure. Like, you know, you want the media to write about you. You want a VC to give you money because you want someone else to say, you're on the right track or you're not doing poorly. Um, But at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter because the only person who needs to give you money is your customer. Great point. Shout out. I'll plug it too. Cause that's how, you know, profit led podcast, I think does a phenomenal job when you have your guests on and talking about the different routes for that. And I think 
given the way social media is today, just with everything, right? Not specific even to the entrepreneurial space, but everyone, like you said, is searching kind of for that validation to prove, hey, my idea works because someone gave me, right, $3 million. But you're exactly right, right? It's the customer. Your idea works if you're willing to find someone that you've made their lives easier, you've helped them with with something, and they're willing to compensate for that, right? And I think that when we look at a lot of people starting companies nowadays, right, where they, and it's shifted, but they might've only wanted to go that VC route. I think, yeah, that's your point, what Greg and you and everyone are talking about, uh, there's a lot of different routes to take it is really important. And the the point you brought up about a lot of the failures and people talking about it, was there maybe like a, a memorable or favorite failure that you felt you had that helped set you up for success today? Yeah, I mean, um, it's not so much a failure. It's just a decision that I made. I, I mean, one is like, like choosing that blue ocean opportunity. It's because sure. I had that experience that I was able to, you know, pick eWebinar as the idea, right? Like what, where we are right now is purple ocean. Like it's not red ocean. Red is like, it's too crowded. Like a CRM would be red ocean. Um, but purple ocean is really taking an existing business model that works and applying it to an untouched vertical. Right. And, and that's what we did here. Um, and I think another one was one of the things that I did which wasn't a failure, but was not so good of a decision was we created a product that was so niche, like in real estate for open houses in North America, like it was so niche and built for that particular business process that when we weren't doing well, it wasn't possible for us to go into other verticals without significantly changing the product. So fortunately we powered through and eventually became you know, the, the category leader for what we did because there, there wasn't anyone to compete with. Um, but coming into eWebinar, like I knew that I wanted to do something that was not bounded by geography or language um, or roles, right? Or types of companies or industries. Like I wanted something that was really agnostic so that if it didn't work out where we started, that we could we could expand our market. Okay. That's great. And actually kind of, I know a little side work too, but how, how did you meet your, you know, your team or co-founders, your group at eWebinar um, currently? Yeah. So David is my life partner. He's also my CTO co-founder. Um, I didn't start off like that. I had a dev shop uh, for the first year. Um, and then David came in a year later and we ended that relationship with that dev shop. And then we also hire our team. Um, most of our developers are in Vietnam because we love going to Vietnam, so we wanted an excuse to go there. Sure. Um, and we also started hiring developers from Ukraine um, through a Norwegian company as well. Um, and so, you know, building building more of a team there. Um, and Todd, my COO, who is really like the jack of all trades that takes care, he's basically like the product manager, or the uh, digital marketing person. He manages all of our content and SEO. Um, he edits my scripts he <laughs> he edits my my long form linkedin posts like he literally does everything he was a previous customer of mine hmm. at spacio um and we just stayed friends and since you know since i left spacio he was with a different a few different startups and when he kind of had a had a gap between jobs i i approached him and he was actually the first one that helped me on hmm. on this business way before anyone else so we kind of conceptualized it together but he couldn't not work um, you know, cause he has real expenses living in New York. So he basically sure. just worked for us weekends and evenings for two years before, oh. um, he quit and, and came to join us full time. But everybody we work with is, um, through referrals. Okay. That's great. And, and I think nowadays too, right. You see so many teams, when, whether you're going to an accelerator or not, or just looking to kind of have that nice technical and, and business experience as like about two headed dragon. I know a lot of people have struggled, right? How do I find my co-founder? How do I go out there and build my team? And a lot of them are first-time founders where they maybe haven't had the luxury of having previous customers or previous teams in their old roles. Are there any tips or maybe suggestions? How, how, should, how would someone go about finding their co-founder or finding uh, their team to start a company? Because as we know, life can be rough out there for a solo founder. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Um... There is no reason to split your house before you know if that person's going to be a good roommate. 
right? Mm. So I've had two co-founders in my life, um, David being the second one. Both co-founders I had were contractors for the company before we decided to move forward as co-founders. Sure. My co-founder and my previous two startups, we worked together for probably like a year and a half, two years before you know, it made sense to be co-founders because I didn't have a co-founder and I was just paying him as a contractor. So mm -hmm. I think that's the best way. Like pay someone as your contractor. See if they even like your project. See if you work well together. See what they can contribute because everybody thinks they can contribute more contribute more than they actually can mm -hmm. and sometimes you might realize like you don't work well together or you're not passionate about the project or they're not passionate about the project and then the uncoupling of that becomes really hard when you have shares involved right it's not like you can just divorce your co-founder like you divorce your husband or wife like i, I would mm -hmm. say that's probably easier so <laughs> um be very careful of who you choose and um there's no rush right you're going to be building this company for years Try to work together as, you know, business associates, pay the person, doesn't matter how much equity you give them, right? Like 50% of zero is still zero. Mm -hmm. So make sure they're just as invested in you, passionate about the project, you work well together. And then once you know how much each of you can contribute, then you can figure out, you know, what is the equity split that, that makes sense for both people. Got it. Love that. And that's what we see a lot, too, when we look at people who bring on formal advisory boards or board of directors. It's kind of that same sense, right? Like just because someone says they can contribute, you have to kind of back it up. And when you say, right, test it out or run that period, is that six months? Is that a year? Obviously, it varies. But is there kind of like how, how long does it take to truly get to know someone or are they just faking it for six months that they're dedicated and then who knows if they fall off? I mean, I think it's so hard to build this thing that you can't fake passion, right? Mm. You can't fake passion or skills, right? You either love it and think about it all the time and dream about it, or you don't, right? Like it's, it's going to be very obvious. And I'm not even speaking of co-founders or like mm -hmm. potential co-founders, even as an employee, you know, like in your heart, how dedicated this, this person is based on how they respond, how quickly they respond. Do they show up, right? Do they show up for the customer? I mean, I would say it's as long as it takes for you to feel like this is someone I can't build my company without, mm. right? Or if this person is not here, I would have a much harder time replacing them. So I think it's more like a gut feeling um, than like a time frame. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a great point there. And with that, when you were going through your founder journey, right, from whether it's any webinar or Spacio or any, any first company, any any time throughout the duration, what's what's really maybe two pieces of advice that you would tell newer founders, right? Maybe this is their first company, maybe it's their second company that they're they're starting to see traction on. What are maybe the the best two pieces either you've learned or you've received throughout your journey? that you would like to share? Um, just an advice about anything in general. Yeah, does personal career and any, any yeah. tips? Um, I would say like the best piece of advice I've ever received is don't marry your idea. Um, and when I was fairly green, just quit SAP, I was um, trying a different you know, a bunch of different ideas and I was pitching my friends or mentors or people that were like way ahead of me to see what they thought. And for no reason at all, I would like defend it. Right. And even if it was a bad idea, I would, I would defend it. And I wouldn't, I wasn't a very great listener. And before I left my friend's office, he said, Hey, Melissa, don't marry your idea. And in that moment, I almost felt like so embarrassed because I knew what had happened. Right. I knew that this is a person I went to because I respected him and I had an idea and I wasn't listening and it wasn't very good, but I just probably appeared stubborn um, and like just young, right? Like just kind of immature, professionally immature. So ever since then, um, when I asked for feedback, I actually listened and I, and I question my own conclusions and I leave room for myself to be wrong. Um, and I think like, it's, it's also so important for you to be, to, for you to have confidence and almost be, be delusional about what you want to build, but it's also 
important to be cautiously optimistic that maybe you could be wrong and maybe someone else, you know, is, is showing you some blind spots, I guess, that, that you haven't seen. Um, and I guess the second piece of advice, I would have, I have to, I would have to think harder for this one. Um, but one of my friends once told me, I asked him cause I, I was not in a very good place in my second startup. I couldn't get things going. And he had sold his company some years ago for 25 million. Um, and he was like, a, like he was like a success story in Vancouver. And I was having drinks with him and I asked him, you know, what was the best thing that you did for your career? And he said, you know, when I was my mid twenties, I had 600 bucks in my pocket and I moved to New York and the rest was history. Like he joined a company. Um, he was part of that exit. He was like the first team member of that company. He, you know, and then he had that exit and then he had money to start his own startup, which eventually sold for 25 million. So at that point I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like I've never been to New York. <laughs> you know, I have more than 600 bucks in my pocket. Like, why don't I just go to New York? And that was, and that started my journey of going to New York for a month, every other month. I was living in Vancouver at the time for about a year and a half before I decided to make that leap and, and go there full time. And it's because I went to New York that I ended up meeting David, who is now my co-founder and life partner. I started uh, making a lot more connections in, in real estate, which ended up, um, which ended up um, being a good decision to grow my company. And I would say it's because I moved to New York that that company was eventually acquired. So okay. big, not big. advice that can apply to everybody, but if you're even thinking about moving to New York or, or if you're in a life stage where you feel like you want to be around more ambitious, more motivated people that are like mentally closer to where you are today, I don't think there's a better city for that. Love that. And I think obviously the Vancouver, the flight from Vancouver to New York is probably not the uh, easiest to make consistently, but I think that plays to a big point of, right, you, you, there's so many founders and entrepreneurs out there in the world, right, that don't necessarily have the luxury of being in a big hub like New York or Toronto, Vancouver, San Francisco, and, and that are building some amazing things, right? And so a lot of the things we run into nowadays is how how do we have someone that can help challenge us, that can help challenge our assumptions, right? And have that sort of like fanatical confidence that you have while still having someone right like provide real feedback and pick their brain and kind of poke holes into the idea and that really is a big piece that when we look at what founders are doing whether it's in you know the midwest whether it's in the south whether it's latam or africa what have you we kind of see these kind of habits that people develop um, whether it's their first company or their 10th company and do you feel that there's been, whether it's since moving to New York or just since you've started working, right, SAP and before, three habits that you've picked up that you felt made your day-to-day -day or yourself be more successful? I've heard everything from yoga to meditation to just <laughs> running and sitting, turning off screen yeah. time. What's What are three habits that you've picked up that work for you? I am the most consistent person you will ever meet. <laughs> like I always say, like nobody will out-consistent me. I am okay. very good at doing things that are required, not just doing things that I want to do or things that I love. Mm. So I've got a to-do list. I'm going to co complete it. I, there are tasks that I have to show up and do, and I will do them even when I don't feel like it. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two is I have a lot of fun. Like I go to a lot of parties. I let myself enjoy my time with my friends. Um, and that's kind of a earned luxury. I didn't have a lot of that before, but I was always open to having fun and having my weekends and, and evenings. Um, I always had my own schedule. So even during a t time in my life that I worked every day, I would still work around like wanting to have fun and, and going out. So I think it's really important because it's, you know, you're going to be building your company for years. And the most important thing is you figure out how to keep yourself mentally and physically healthy so you can build the healthiest company possible. Um, and I guess the third, which is something that I had to learn as well, is I say no a lot. And I know like people write about this or, or say this, um, but it's not just product decisions or things like that, right? I say no 
to all the things that I don't want to do. Because every time I say yes to something I don't want to do, in the moment I'm doing it, I regret it immensely. So an example is connection calls. I don't do connection calls. I don't care who you are, friend of a friend. Unless you are my friend or my good friend, I don't get on a call. Even if I kind of know you, just tell me what you want on message, or on text, on email, and let's chat that way. I don't need to beat around the bush, right? I'm, I save my in real life time for my friends. I don't do networking events. I don't go to conferences. I don't speak at conferences. Um, you know, I don't do any live broadcasts. Um, and I don't do any sales calls. I don't care how big the company is because my product starts at hundred bucks. Like I do not do sales calls. All the demo is, is done through eWebinar. So these are the things that I say no to because it adds so much to my life, not because it makes my company more money. I want to make sure that I am in the best mindset and I protect my time. So the time that I have is put towards growing my company um, or with my family and friends. Well, I think that's, it's funny, right? Because you see the opposite too with a lot of people. Hey, like I just, I just say yes to everything, right? Someone invites me to go do this thing that I've never done before. Sure, let, let's try it, right? And I think as, especially as an entrepreneur, right, where our time is so valuable and you really have to make conscious decisions as what can I fit into my schedule and the million other things that I have to do the other meetings I have to take. Uh, yeah, it's, it's saying no to be able to free up that time. And I was at a dinner last week where we asked a lot of people around the table, hey, what what kind of what we talked about earlier, what's the biggest reason you went into entrepreneurship? Or you kind of like wanted to decouple that from maybe the standard nine to five? Was it freedom to pursue your ideas? Was it freedom to kind of find financial freedom outside of working for someone else or build your own schedule? Um, maybe it's the ability to kind of give back, right. And, and work on something that can, can help people. And in one way or the other, so would you say there was a kind of one point or one thing that drove you to do that, um, in the first place, right. When you left SAP, other than obviously you identified a problem, but was there something, was it like you said, to, to be able to create your own schedule, to be able to have more time with family and friends, um, things like that. Yeah, so I didn't identify a problem first. I just wanted hmm. my own thing, and um, I came up with a bunch of different ideas after. Um, in fact, I, it wasn't even probably my until my tenth idea that I actually found a business. Um, I just wanted to be rich, and that's the truth, right? Like, I just I didn't have a background in in entrepreneurship. My parents were not entrepreneurs. I thought starting businesses would be easier than working for a company. Now I realize that if you want to be rich, you should just work for a company <laughs> and, you know, work your way up and learn how to invest. Um, but yeah, that was a driving force. I wanted to be rich and I didn't want someone else telling me what to do. Um, but in my journey in wanting to be rich, I realized what I wanted was not to be rich, was to be free. And well, I value freedom over anything else. In fact, I think I think the choices that I make for freedom right now actually help decrease the revenue of my company <laughs> or make it grow slower, but I'm actually okay with that because in life, um, at least for me, there is so much more than work and money and revenue. Um, yeah, I, I want to have both, right? I want to have my work and, and I want to have my life. And that's super refreshing because I feel like you see a lot of founders that have that given the hustle culture environment that... We're seeing a lot more nowadays where it's like, hey, you have, you know, I work 15 hours a day, right? And then after I work, I spend time you know, going to networking events, doing this and, and right. And, and that, that is a lot of fun for some people, right? But I think it's always about that healthy balance, not just for yourself, right? But for the company is you, you can't just do that for a decade, right? And, and be in the good spot to lead the business, right? Whether you have VC backing or it's for yourself and your team. And so I love kind of the, the honest approach to that too, because I think a lot of people have that same mindset, but they're not willing to either admit it, right? Or know, hey, this, this is why I decided to start, right? It's not necessarily for reason X or reason Y, um, it's for myself, right? And I think that's a big point. So kind of coming up with the final two questions here. So I'll just, any piece of content, right? Whether it's some Netflix show, whether it's a, a really good book you read or podcast, what what's what are you like kind of consuming now from a content perspective that you recommend to listeners out there? 
Um, yeah, so I'm a fan of the Traction podcast that Lloyd Lobo runs. He interviews like a lot of tech celebrities, I guess. Uh, okay. So I love that. Um, Practical Founders podcast that um, Greg Head, um, he interviews like bootstrap founders, which he calls Practical Founders and their story. Mm. And, um, and I love that because it like every single one is so unique that it's it's just encouraging and refreshing to hear how other people have been successful and how they've grown their company and their trials and tribulations and their exits and, and things like that. Um, Alex Hormozy, I really like. Uh, follow him on Instagram. I'm reading his um, book, $100 Million Offers. Um, and also, I think he has a podcast that I just started listening to as, as well. Um... Those are the top three, I guess, that come. Those are the, the regular things that, that I listen to. Okay, great. Oh, and great. actually also Thanks. Kyle Poyar's newsletter. He's the only newsletter. Um, he's like the PLG guy. Okay. Um, he's the only newsletter that I will save and read like word for word. And he, like every newsletter he writes, I don't know how he does it, but every newsletter he writes is like a research paper. <laughs> And that's, I think, when in the time where we have so much content out there, right, so many amazing newsletters and podcasts and things, that that's why I like asking that question, right? Because so many, there, we have endless things to consume, right? And just like people listening to this, right? Thank you for choosing this over all the other also podcasts out there. But when we have amazing guests that kind of use these vessels to learn for themselves, I think a lot of other listeners and founders who want to follow in those footsteps um, really appreciate that advice. So. Yeah, thanks for sharing that and, and the whole journey and the story in itself. If people want to learn more, if they want to connect, learn more about your webinar yourself, uh, do you recommend any specific way? LinkedIn, uh, you know, Substack, how, how should they get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. So the best way to get in touch with me is through LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Melissa Kwan, last name spelled K-W-A-N. Um, and if you're curious about you know, eWebinar, how it can help you or your, or your business, just go to eWebinar.com. We've got a demo there that's, of course, delivered through eWebinar, so I don't have to do any live demos. And I manage the chat as well, so if you have any questions about my journey or the product, um, just type in the chat. And if you, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I write weekly about my experience bootstrapping three companies. Fantastic. Well, we appreciate the, the time and knowledge drops here today, Melissa, and looking forward to uh, continuing the conversation in the future. Take care. Thank you so much.